Aviation writer and plane and pilot consultant Tim Kern sat down with aviation legend Pete Law. They talked about everything from Pete's time at the Lockheed Skunk Works to what he does here with the airplanes at Reno for ADI and carburation. I'm Tim Kern and we're recording here for Plane and Pilot and I, I'm with uh, engineer Pete Law. He's been at Reno every year that there's been a race at Reno. He knows just about everything, so we're going to ask him about almost everything. Pete, I missed some of I missed some of your bio. You want to fill us in on the rest? All right. I started at Lockheed back in 1959 as a thermodynamics engineer on the F-104 environmental control system, and in two and a half years, I was stolen by Ben Rich of the Lockheed Skunk Works to go work on the uh, A-12, which was the predecessor to the SR-71. I also got to work on the U-2. F-117 later on and quite a few more interesting airplanes. I became involved with air racing when one of our A-12 test pilots, Darrell Greenemeyer, came to Ben Rich and wanted some thermodynamic help on reducing the drag of his racing Bearcat, which he had raced in 1964 at Reno. And this was the, after the race in September. And Ben Rich said, well, you need to go to see Pete Law. He knows a lot about what you want to do with your water boiling, oil cooling type system. In the uh, to cool oil by boiling ADI instead of taking air on board, which decreases the drag, increases the speed. And we had done similar things on the F-104 to cool the environmental control system when we were flying at Mach 2. You needed to boil some water to cool the air enough to be able to cool the pilot and the electronics equipment. And as a result of Ben and Daryl coming into my office and saying, Pete, this is Daryl Greenemeyer. He'd like you to help on, on his Second World War racing airplanes. I said, well, I don't know very much about Second World War airplanes, but I know somebody who eats, sleeps, and breathes them. And he's downstairs. He's an aerodynamic structures person. His name's Bruce Boland. He came right upstairs. And since that point on, Bruce and I have been helping Daryl and a whole bunch of other people make their airplanes faster with all kinds of in interesting secret things that we figured out how to do. Now, Daryl Greenemeyer is the same one who's the five-time unlimited champion, four-time sport champion, and in fact, he's actually racing a Lancer Legacy. Uh, if we can get all the pieces back together, he'll be racing that in this year's race. Yes, well, I started helping Daryl on his sport plane about six years ago when he decided he was going to get back into this airplane racing because he had been out of it for a long time, but when they opened up the sport class, he figured, okay, this is a good time to get in. His Bearcat is in the Smithsonian in the Udvar-Hazy Museum, and he decided he wanted to get back into racing, but he wasn't going to get his Bearcat back, so he started in the sport class, and for the first three years, uh, Dave Morse won the race, and then Daryl said, hey, I'm going to get into this. I want to beat John Sharp, who was building his nemesis, NXT. So... Daryl says, well, I need to do water injection and spray bar cooling of the oil and the cylinder heads and, and my intercoolers, and I have to do all of this in for, uh, with water injection fluid like we used to do in the old days in the Bearcat. So I said, no problem, I'll help you out. And while NXT was getting built and put together, Daryl won four years in a row. Mm -hmm. And finally, John Sharp got his act together, and then Daryl started not being as fast as NXT, but I still help him and along with a few other things that we're doing and some of the other airplanes to come in the future in the uh, Super Sport class. Well, you know, you're keeping in mind, of course, that the, uh, that the, that the Super Sport NXT is a, it is uh, within the rules, of course, of sport class, but it was really designed to be a race airplane. The Lancer Legacy, which is the base of Daryl's airplane, is still pretty evident in the airplane that he's flying. I mean, a civilian shouldn't fly an airplane like that, but uh, you can fly one awfully close. Yes. Along with the other things that Daryl has done, uh, he did have an F-104 that he set the, the world's low-altitude speed record at Mach 1.3, which was, I think it's 886 miles an hour up in Tonopah, Nevada. And, uh, of course, we helped, I helped him with uh, the Bearcat set the world speed record in 1969 to beat the Germans' record that was set in 1939. Uh, it was uh, in the order of uh, 469 and we upped it to 482. And then Bruce Bolin and I as engineers on other people's airplanes after Daryl stopped racing, the Red Baron P-51 10 years later upped the speed record, the low altitude 3 kilometer speed record to 499 miles an hour. 
And then Lyle Shelton, which Bruce and I uh, also worked on his Bearcat, Rare Bear, and he upped the speed record to uh, 528 miles an hour. And Bruce and I were involved in all of those, along with a lot of others that have come in, in between that have won Reno. Now, other, other Reno winners that you've been associated with, uh, well, they're, one of the things that people need to know is that very few airplanes win the unlimited class, obviously only one a year. But since 1987 or 8, I better check this, but since 1987 or 8, only three airplanes have won it, uh, well, one more, September Fury won it in 2006 with uh, Mike Brown. But only three airplanes have won the unlimited other than that one uh, Sea Fury, and that's Strega, Dago Red, and Rare Bear. Right, and I worked on all of those. And you worked on Dreadnought, which won before that. Yes, what? yes, and Candace and Jeannie, and a whole, uh, several others that, uh, that were very fast in those days. Um, Candace, which was uh, Dr. Cliff Cummins' uh, airplane that was a P-51. But a lot of these airplanes didn't have the water boiling oil cooling systems. I was doing carburetors and water injection system and spray bar cooling for the radiators that cool the engine circulating fluid or spraying water onto the engine cylinders to cool them so that they don't overheat. And uh, I did help on the initial development of Dago Red. The initial development for this was for uh, uh, Bill DeStephanie and Frank Taylor and then Bill DeStephanie uh, ended up wanting to race one himself, so we built Strega for him. And in the meantime, we had uh, done the Red Baron P-51, and uh, I'm trying to think. A Dreadnought, as you mentioned, Argonaut. Uh, now we're working on Voodoo. I've been working on Voodoo for several years. And uh, Michael Brown's September Fury and mm -hmm. September Pops, both of those airplanes had my water injection and, and carburation and uh, cooling systems in them. Now, lest, lest a lot of experimenters at home decide that they want to run a garden hose on their running engine to keep it cool, uh, do you want to explain a little bit about how the water, or how the alcohol, how all these things don't actually touch things that might explode? Right. Well, what a water injection is, is a fluid that's injected into the engine with the fuel. It's a mixture of 50% methanol and 50% water by volume. And what it does is it slows the flame front down so you can go to much higher manifold pressures with the engine carburetor set to what's called best power. Normally when they're flying at high power, they fly with an air-to-fuel ratio of about 0.1 or 10 to 1, depending upon whether you're air-to-fuel or fuel-to-air ratio. And when you de-rich the carburetor, in other words, knock the fuel flow down to about a 0.08 to a 0.084 air-to-fuel ratio, you have to add something to the to the mixture to slow the flame front down in the cylinder, it will burn the piston, pre-ignite and burn the cylinder or the, and the piston. And what they've done now is they've developed very good high octane racing fuels that are even higher than what they used in the Second World War, where they did use water injection. All the water injection systems that I'm using on other people's aircraft have all been developed for Second World War airplanes and I modify them to be able to be used on these kinds of airplanes. A Pratt & Whitney engine, I have Pratt & Whitney water regulators, water injection systems on them. On Wright aircraft engines, the 3350s will have Wright type systems on those and I even have Pratt & Whitney's R2800 water injection regulators on Wright engines. The uh, principle is that if you put the right amount of water, you can cool the air coming from the carburetor after it's supercharged cools the charge down so that it doesn't get up to 100 degrees centigrade. You want it around 75 to 80 degrees centigrade as it goes into the cylinder. And then you put the derich carburetor, you get optimum power. So if you put in about four tenths of a pound of ADI alcohol mixture with one pound of fuel, that's about the optimum ratio for keeping detonation going down. And you can double the horsepower of a Merlin engine from 1,500 to 3,000. The radial engines, you can't multiply the power as much because they're an air-cooled engine. So you can multiply the horsepower of them by about one and a half. And this is all because you've mixed the right amount of fuel and water together as it's injected at the supercharger and compressed and then goes to the cylinders to burn. 